Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn, for having me tonight. I'm thrilled to see you and thrilled to see some familiar faces um, on here this evening. I'm hoping we can share our screen. Um, Brian Romanowski, who's with us from our office, if we can, Brian, are you able to share your screen? Not or... yet. Give me a second and he will be. Okay. Thank you so much. No. I want to share problem. a little PowerPoint um, with you all to kind of guide us through our discussion tonight. Okay, so Brian, I'm going to make you a co-host, and then you will be able to share your screen. And it's done. Okay. There we go. All right. Well, thank you so much. Here we go. Um, so it's so nice to be back with you all again. I um, I feel like I was just with you recently, but I, I think it actually was closer to when I joined office um, in June 2020. So it's been a, um, a while since I've had a chance to chat with some of you. So thank you so much for, for having me again. Brian, if we could go to the next slide. Um, we had a wonderful celebration um, with the Nationals team, and I was able to honor uh, the senior villages and Lynn and her leadership um, and all of you on uh, at a Nats game in August. And it was so great to be on the field uh, with Lynn and we have some photos here. So thank you so much for those of you who joined us that evening. It was a really special night um, to celebrate, and be with each other. Absolutely. Um, go ahead to the next slide, Brian. Thanks so much. So I think I've had a chance to meet many of you before, but as Lynn mentioned, um, I have a background in business and hospitality. Um, I've worked at a number of restaurants and hotels. I've worked in senior living communities um, really since I was eight years old, and in particular at uh, Brookdale property in New York. And that kind of inspired my dream to become a healthcare lawyer. Um, and which is why I went to law school at Georgetown and ultimately was a health and aging fellow on Capitol Hill working for Senator Blumenthal uh, from the state of Connecticut where I grew up. And it was through all of those experiences that I really believe in the importance of having social spaces for seniors um, to gather. And we'll talk about that in a moment when we talk about some of what I'm fighting for in the budget. Um, but it's one of the reasons that I'm so grateful for the work of the Georgetown Village and know how important our programming is for all of us um, to stay engaged and intellectually stimulated and socialized and have physical movement. Um, and I know all of the volunteering you all do is so important as well. So um, thanks for being involved and thank you again for Lynn for your leadership. Um, I then went to the DC Attorney General's office where I was a tax lawyer and did tax litigation on behalf of the city and then became the assistant attorney general for policy and legislative affairs. So I was working for our attorney general, Carl Racine, um, on many issues from the privacy to workers' rights, um, to seniors' rights, environmental justice, cannabis, um, really a, a large spectrum of, of issues. And then um, in, 2020 decided to run for office to represent Ward 2 on the DC Council and really thrilled um, that I was sworn in June of 2020. And so really my entire campaign and time I've served on the council has been in this COVID-like environment uh, and not COVID-like, COVID environment. Um, and so I really uh, feel the energy and the desire to return to not, not an old sense of normalcy, but our new normal that we're having and just a real desire to have community and be with each other in person um, is really important. And is I feel it palpably when I'm in the community for folks. Um, you can go to the next slide, Brian. So um, just one other thing I wanna talk about uh, before we get to the budget priorities. So I serve on five committees on the council. There are four kind of permanent committees, and those are the business, Committee on Business and Economic Development, uh, the Committee on Housing, the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety, and the Committee on Government Operations. And so 
those are the committees that take up the majority of my time on the council, the hearings that I prioritize, the bills that we focus on and mark up and ultimately pass. But I'm also serving on a special tax task force for COVID recovery um, at the moment as well. And so that kind of spans all issues. Um, and so that's, that's what we've been focused on. And we've been having performance, performance agency oversight hearings the last six weeks or so that just ended last week, which has been a really good opportunity to speak, listen to public witnesses and speak directly to agency directors and other government representatives uh, to hold them accountable for what has been funded in the budget, what they've said their priorities are going to be, um, and really address a lot of the questions that you all and others ask our office throughout the year to make sure we can follow up with those agencies. Um, so for our Ward 2 budget, so the budget process is in full swing. Um, Mayor Bowser and her team are currently formulating what will be their proposed budget for next year, which as a reminder, we'll pa we passed the budget in the uh, summer and it goes into effect October 1st of 2022 through September 30th of 2023. So um, the mayor and her team are coming up with their budget right now and they will present it to the council next Wednesday, March 16th. At that time, the budget will be broken up into various segments and go to all of our committees um, for more focused analysis. We'll have hearings on all the committees, we'll hear from public witnesses, we'll hear from the agencies and what they need to fund the programs that we think are important. Um, and we'll have an opportunity to make changes to that budget uh, throughout our budget process at the council. And then ultimately we'll pass the budget this June of 2022. And so, uh, a little over a month ago, I sent to Mayor Bowser my list of Ward 2 budget priorities on behalf of the ward. Um, this was through you know, meeting with thousands of residents over the course of the last year. We had a Ward 2 budget uh, open Zoom dialogue where anybody could, could uh, per submit ideas for the budget. And... Uh, really synthesized and came up with our list of major priorities. And so these are some of what I want to talk to you all about tonight. Um, and then definitely make sure we have time for questions and ideas, um, most importantly, to hear from you all. So uh, one of my top budget asks this year was for a new standalone Ward 2 Senior Center. And I spoke a little bit about this when I was talking about uh, my background working in senior living communities. But I think it is so important that in Ward 2, where we have access to some fantastic amenities to public transportation, to so many restaurants and small businesses, um, wide sidewalks, that we have a standalone senior center for our seniors to gather um, and visit with one another and enjoy time together in, in spaces. And so I'm really enthusiastic about this. I spoke to the mayor and her team about this idea last week. And I'm really hopeful that it'll be included in the mayor's proposed budget, which will make it much easier for us to, to get it passed. Um, but if it's not, I will still be fighting uh, for inclusion for this and just working with my colleagues to try to find the funding for it elsewhere. Um, public safety continues to be a major concern um, for us on the council. And I know I hear it from neighbors every day. Uh, we have experienced some really unacceptable violence over the course of the last year. And I share your frustration um, and everyone's frustration that we have to do more to keep our residents safe. Our DC government, our federal partners, um, all of our neighbors have to work together. I think it's really important. And what we've been focused on is finding comprehensive approaches to addressing public safety. Um, I've joined MPD for public safety walkthroughs and ride-alongs um, in areas where unsafe activity has occurred or been reported. Um, I have had conversations and meetings with pretty much every stage along the public safety apparatus from fighting for more funding to our out of school time so our kids are supervised um, to the Metropolitan Police Department to our violence interrupters to our United States Attorney's Office and our Office of Attorney General, um, to our court system, our local courts and our federal courts, 
um, as well as our jail system and our Office of Returning Citizens, every piece along the continuum of our public safety apparatus is so important that we're working collectively together um, as we, like most other major cities in the country, have been experiencing um, so much gun violence and, and really unacceptable um, incidents of crime. And so that is a major focus for us. I did request um, in my budget letter to the mayor additional funding for our violence interruption programs, our out of school time programs, as I mentioned, and then also an expansion of our Metropolitan Police Department bike and foot patrols. I also am supporting bolstering our MPD cadet training program so that our officers are based in the communities that they serve. Um, our schools have been a major focus for us as we seek to modernize our work order system um, and are thrilled that our kids are back in school safely. Um, and just noting for everybody that yesterday, DC Health announced that there will no longer be a mask requirement for all of our schools. So it's now up to the school system to determine. So DCPS still will have um, their mask requirement for now. Um, for this third piece, addressing homelessness, moving neighbors into housing, I know that this is another um, major concern of so many people in our ward and our city and our office um, to help neighbors experiencing homelessness move into housing as quickly as possible. We've seen more visible encampments throughout the pandemic. Um, and we have the most unsheltered neighbors living in Ward 2 than anywhere in the city. So this year's budget, the one that we passed last year that's being implemented this year, um, has tens of millions of dollars of permanent supportive housing vouchers. For the first time in history, it's an unprecedented amount of vouchers and the mayor's office is now deploying those vouchers and using a pilot program to expedite the process. And when I say permanent supportive housing vouchers, it means not just money to pay the rent, but all of the wraparound services that we know are so important to helping somebody live a stable life, including access to mental health care, access to physical health care, um, check-ins and supervision about how things are going, um, job support. And so we know that that is really important, but it's, it's not moving us as quickly as we'd like it to. And so that's one of the things that we've been pushing on during agency oversight is making sure that our agencies responsible for deploying these vouchers have the staffing and resources they need to get people matched into housing more quickly um, that is sustainable and safe. Uh, there was a care pilot program where the deputy mayor for health and human services selected a number of sites in, in the city that had the largest encampments um, and went to those sites and offered folks housing and, and worked with them for weeks to move folks into housing. And that program, I believe, has been very successful thus far. Um, and so our hope is that it's expanded to other sites throughout the ward. I've also requested um, 15 to $25 million for a new transitional housing site in Ward 2. So folks can use the site as bridge housing to go and stay in um, while their, their housing is being secured. I've also called for the expansion of the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, the expansion of the Department of Behavioral Health's Community Response Team, which diverts 911 calls from MPD to mental health professionals who can help folks in crisis. Um, last year, I also introduced the Recovery Act, which really incentivizes better use or different use of much of our vacant office space that we have in the Central Business District in downtown. And the hope is to use a mix of tools from tax incentives to grants um, to incentivize housing, uh, affordable housing, retail spaces, hotels, green spaces to make use of, of some of the space downtown. Um, so our fourth bucket item here for small business and pandemic recovery, this has been a real passion of mine um, my whole life in, in supporting our small business community, but really a major focus on us, um, on our office since I, since I joined the council, especially because of the devastation so much of our small business community experienced throughout the pandemic. Um, we've introduced a number of bills to support our small businesses, one of which is called the BEST Act, 
uh, which streamlines the licensing process so that entrepreneurs um, can more intuitively get into business. Uh, I requested funding for the business improvement districts to be able to fill, help fill vacant ground floor retail spaces with priority to small local minority and women owned businesses. Um, the council just passed our reopen DC bill that extends streeteries. Um, and we are thinking through and working with the deputy mayor's office for planning and economic development, other uh, grants and proposals for our small businesses, our arts establishments to have more access to grant funding. Um, so Brian, you can go to the next slide. Great. Um, well, thank you so much. So we are having community office hours this Friday at Mitchell Park. Um, I know it's not in Georgetown, um, but close by-ish. If anybody is available to join us, we'll be there from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. Um, and it'll just be a great opportunity to chat outdoors. It's supposed to be a beautiful day um, and have a chance to meet one another and hear how our team can be helpful um, to you all and hear some of your ideas as well. My whole team uh, will be there with me on Friday. Um, our A and C redistricting. So as a reminder, we engaged in ward redistricting this past year, uh, which has to happen by law once every 10 years. So those, the new ward lines already went into effect. So nothing changed on our Western border where Georgetown is, um, but ward two did just gain 12,000 new residents in Shaw, uh, which we're really excited about. And so those lines went into effect January 1, 2022. Now every ward, including Ward 2, is engaged in A and C boundary line redistricting. And there's a task force. Austin Naughton is the chair of the task force. Um, and Eric Langenbacher and Monica Roche are the A and C 2E representatives on the task force. And they've been meeting every week. Um, all of their meetings are open to the public. And Brian, if I can ask you to put the link in the chat to our redistricting website. Um, so all of those meetings are open to the public. You can review the recordings. But on next Monday, March 4th, this coming Monday, March 14th at 645, there's a town hall, meaning if any of you want to sign up to testify or participate or offer your opinions on where the new AMC line should go, you're welcome to do so. Um, and I talked a little bit about the budget process, but next week, when the, once the mayor sends us her uh, proposed budget, we are then going to be having budget hearings. And it'll be really important for the committees and my colleagues and me to hear directly from you all and Ward 2 residents about other budget priorities, um, about how the agencies are performing um, so we can be a collective voice and advocating on behalf of Ward 2. So, are there any other slides, Brian? All right, perfect. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and I will take any questions that anybody has, or, or as I mentioned, listen to any ideas that anyone has to share. Thanks. Lynn. Thank you. And before we start questions, I'm gonna put in a shameless plug. The mayor has been very generous in the past in terms of villages, and I hope we're still in the budget, but if we are and you call into the mayor or testify, be sure to mention how valuable your Georgetown village is to your neighborhood. Um, we've had a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I don't know if the person who posted them would like to ask them himself or herself. If not, I am happy to read them out loud. If you wanted to ask the question yourself, please unmute. And not hearing anybody, I'm going to read it. So from iPad 4, the question was, with record surplus, why did the council raise taxes? Sorry, Brooke. No, that's OK. It's a completely fair question. And it's a question that I asked my colleagues as well. Um, and it's a, a vote that I voted as a tax increase that I voted against um for many reasons but yes we did have a surplus last year we received uh not only a surplus through our our taxes um our local taxes but also we received 3.3 billion dollars from the federal government and we've also established by law a tax revision commission whose responsibility 
uh, will be to analyze the entirety of our tax code, um, not just what we need now, but how we can be successful over the course of the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, how we can compete successfully with Maryland and Virginia so we don't lose people right over the border um, if they can save money on taxes. And it was proposed um, one day before the, the budget vote. There was no hearing um, and I voted against, against it. Um, I lost the vote, but um, ultimately there was a tax increase that went into effect for residents who were making um, $250,000 a year per individual um, or more that went into effect this year. Thank you. Um, before I go back to the chat, does anybody want to ask anything in person? Okay, back to the chat. Um, so we have a question again about the council. Oh, uh, let's see, I'm sorry. Oh, so as you work for the attorney general, what do you think about the policy of not prosecuting juveniles for carjacking and murder? Um, so I, what do I think about the policy for not prosecuting ju juveniles? I think that, um, our young people need to have access to much more supports in our city. That's why we increase out of school time budget by 20% last year. That's why I'm calling for that to be doubled again this year. Um, because we see so much of the the crime and the gun violence is happening uh, to and by young people against one another. So, so many of our victims of gun violence and homicide are people who have returned from jail or prison themselves. And it is a, a terrible cycle. That's why I also support violence interruption programs so that people, many of whom have lived experience being in gangs, um, can get to know folks who are engaged in this activity and try to prevent violence from happening before it even occurs. And so that is a really important part of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and, still happening. And, right. So, and when somebody commits a crime or a carjacking or a theft or a murder, um, they have to be held accountable for that. So they haven't been. So there have been some instances for a few reasons um, that have been problematic. The first of all, we don't have uh, control of our local prosecutions for the most part um, for violent offenses. Many of them are referred to the U.S. Attorney's Office. And so when we looked at the data to see, who, are, people, are people being arrested for these crimes? Yes. Are people being prosecuted for these crimes? Yes. Are people still sometimes being released for these crimes? Also, yes. And so as we try to figure out where the gap is in the system, um, one of the challenges is that some of these cases are being referred to federal court, which does not have the full gamut of rehabilitative services that we have in DC. So in DC, if a young person is prosecuted, some of their punishment is probably going to include jail time. But in addition to jail time, it'll probably also include supervision after someone gets out of jail, especially if they're a young person, um, access to courses and training and school while they're in jail. Um, and the federal system doesn't have that. And so we have seen over and over again that federal judges have been saying, well, we're going to release somebody because we don't have access to all those programs, which is, in my view, backwards thinking, because now we're providing none of the services um, or none, nor any of the uh, accountability. And so that's why I think that the DC system is much better suited um, to, to work with and um, hold young people accountable when they have violated the law, which is unacceptable. Thank you, Brooke. Um, so I have a participant who said they've been trying to get an answer about, um, and this is a, res a Hillendale resident, about the Ellington Field renovation project. Do you um, have any answers for them? I'm so sorry to hear that you weren't able to get in touch with us. 
Um, Brian, if I can ask you to put Ella's email in the chat, Ella Hansen on our team will be the best point of contact um, about this. We have put additional money in last year's budget for updates and renovations to Ellington Field. There have been a lot of community conversations um, with neighbors, with uh, DPR, with our office, with um, the ANC commissioners and Commissioner Kishan Puta um, to ensure that the needs of the neighbors are accomplished. And so there have been concerns about lighting, um, how it's gonna face inwards and not affect the surrounding homes, concerns about parking, um, concerns about just quickly finishing the, the renovation of the field. And so um, our office has been involved with uh, Department of Parks and Rec to make sure that all of those concerns from neighbors are incorporated into the plan. Um, but if you reach out to Ella Hansen on our team, we should be able to provide you any other um, answers to questions you have as the timeline moves forward. Can I just, I have tried to send an email and have not gotten a response from Ms. Hansen. Okay. Um, sorry, who was that speaking? My name is Betty Greenwald and I'm involved with the Hillendale Homeowners Association. And we have been trying to get a communication with your office and so far have been unsuccessful. Okay, well, thank you so much for letting me know that. I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, let me just take a note of that and we'll make sure we follow up. Um, thank you. Betty Greenwald. G-R-E-E-N-W-O-L-D. And, um, and Lynn, Carol Kelly here, if you can hear me. Yes, we got you. Uh, I'm president of Georgetown Village and have served on the board there for the last three and a half years. And I thank you very much for your unique understanding of seniors, their connectivity to the community and their ability to stay and age in the community and uh, for the community to be benefited by that and the reverse. So thank you very much for all those efforts. I just wanted to bolster just a little while we have you what Betty said about the Ellington Field. In addition to the concerns that you went through, uh, you know, many of us as seniors have used that field for years as our opportunity to engage in some kind of activity during the day and walking. And I think reasonable access for the community in, in some period is important. And one other aspect I put on your radar screen is we also, and we're very lucky to have Georgetown Hospital here and a new building opening up there. But I don't think we really have an idea yet of what kind of traffic that is gonna mean for Reservoir Road when that second hospital facility opens up. Um, and I did hear uh, several DPR sessions and it seemed to me when they talked about traffic congestion, they really weren't looking at it from the perspective of the area of a whole and the university and the new hospital opening. So to me, all those things need to be thought out um, in conjunction with bringing more people into the community who will come to see their children in and, you know, sports activities and they're going to want access too. Um, you know, reasonably, and we don't have a lot of bus service and we don't have very good subway service here either. So uh, I don't wanna belabor the point, but just a few other things for you to think about while we have your attention. And thank you again for joining us tonight. Um, thank you so I, much. I uh, say something uh, along the, um, uh, the vein of the, George, of the Ellington Field. My name is Pat Scalero. I'm a Berleith re representative. I spoke to the president of the Burley Citizens Association before I um, came to the meeting tonight and asked, since we knew you were going to be here, our representative, uh, did he have any questions or thoughts? And again, it goes back to the Ellington Field. And um, apparently the construction is going to start in the fall. And yet a number of questions have not yet been answered according to him, you know, particularly in terms of um, additional use of the field. We know the priorities are going to be given to the schools, uh, but nobody seems to want to discuss uh, if it's going to be made available to other groups, groups outside of the school system, uh, uh, affairs or programs in the evening. Um, parking, again, continues to be um, a problem. 
a, a serious question with the residents and also the final construction of the field. And we, according to Eric, we don't seem to be getting as much as many progress reports, nor do are we being asked for uh, more information about what is important to the community with it. Uh, but thank you for, for hearing us about these things. Okay. Thank you so much for letting, letting me know that. Um, and we will certainly follow up with DPR and make sure that um, all of the, when they share with us that, you know, we're trying to incorporate a new plan to address some of the needs that we've raised um, on your behalf and that you all have raised directly, um, really reiterating too that they communicate with the public about what those timelines are because, you know, they keep saying summer or, or next fall, but that's going to be here before we know it. And we want to make sure that those needs are, are incorporated. So we will definitely follow up with DPR on that. Thank you. Sorry, and now on to uh, another favorite subject, DMV. So they've been closed for a bit of time. Um, and uh, the question is, after being closed, will they be um, reopening in Georgetown Park, do you know? So um, my incredible call a friend, Brian Romanowski, who's our Director of Constituent Services, has just typed in the chat that the Georgetown DMV on M Street should now be open Tuesdays through Saturdays from 8, 15 a.m. to 4 p.m., um, but is closed on Sundays and Mondays. Okay, thank you, and your wonderful call of friends also gave us information about the water pipes, so. Um, he is just the best call of friend, isn't he? <laughs> well, that's great. Um, are there other questions that we want to ask Brooke that, that are not in the chat now that we've gone through those in the chat? Um, and so if nobody else is jumping on this, I have a question for you. When you mentioned the senior center in Ward 2, clearly personal interest, uh, where do you think it might be located? So I do not know. It depends. Um, I think it's important that it be located close to public transportation um, and in a standalone space. I think that it's important that it's not just part of some other establishment, that there's some programming. I think you know, as we deal with um, the curbs and the accessibility and the full space that we need our own space for this purpose. Um, and so that's what I communicated to the mayor and her team. Um, and so they are going to be looking for a site, is my hope, um, to either lease or acquire to use for this purpose. So as soon as I know or have a sense of um, areas they're looking at, I will let you know uh, directly, Lynn. Thank you. And will it also um, hopefully have ample parking because there are people who drive or who need, who can't use public transportation. It would need a car to get them there. Absolutely. Great point, of course. Excellent. Thank you. Are there um, more questions for Brooke? Yes. Okay. Tony. Yes. Just on that same, same subject. Uh, I've not been brought up to date at all on the situation with Jellif. Um, and that's somewhat related to seniors as well, because I believe that one of the proposals was to have some space available in the, the redone Jellif building, which of course is smack in the middle of Georgetown, um, that, that seniors could use for larger activities. Can you speak to that? Sure. Um, and thank you so much, Tony, for bringing up Jellif. Jellif was our number one budget priority for last year. And we're so thrilled that we were able to secure $28 million for a full um, renovation modernization of JLF. Um, and so that process has commenced, but like most things um, that are major projects is going to take Years. some time. So the course of the last six months have really been about involving the community, making sure that there are um, direct representatives and an input from the community who li lives in the surrounding area and who uses the space to let the architects and the design team and DPR know, um, here are our priorities around parking. Here are our priorities around senior spaces. Here are our priorities around um, having a separate boy and girl locker room has come up or about um, indoor versus outdoor swimming pool access. So all of those conversations have been going on um, and the design phase 
is uh, has commenced. And so um, that type of programming and senior programming is my hope and expectation will be included as part of the project. Um, and I'll look at my call a friend here if you can give me a wink, but I think that we're thinking about, I think it's probably gonna be a 2024 timeline, um, if not 2025 for the entire modernization to be completed. Okay, thank you. I know um, that I, I question, has it. Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to follow up on the Jello comment and then I'll be happy to yield the floor to you. Um, I know that I attended a couple of meetings about Jello, and one of the things we were discussing was um, outdoor um, exercise uh, uh, equipment, if you will, for seniors. Now, if you look at what's being done in Sweden and you know other places, there are many fabulous, you know, kind of outdoor exercise routines and equipment that's you know, all weather and can be outside and is, you know, built for seniors and adults. And so we're hoping that when the Jellip um, Community Center does get re renovated, that that is included as well. Thank you so much for raising that. I love that idea. And I, I have seen similar models. And we even have some great parks in DC um, that have more access to outdoor exercise equipment um, that I think is really effective um, and a great feature. So we'll um, we'll definitely follow up with them on that. Excellent, thank you. And I'm sorry, you had started to say something. I don't know your name, but I know I cut you off, I'm sorry. I've had four. Oh, I, just was gonna, I was just go. gonna ask this to Mark Grayson. Uh, thank you, Mark. I walk a lot and there have been many, many incidents of bikes and scooters almost running me over walking my dog. I see the police, I'd ask them something. They said they're, they are not allowed to do anything about bikes or scooters. They are not in those bike lanes and they can still go in and out and almost run you over. Well, how can we get some kind of regulation of bikes and scooters? And I know the bike lobby is very strong and they don't want any regulation. They feel that they should have the right of the road. Well, thank you very much. And I'm sorry that that's happened to you. Um, so a few thoughts. One, I'm not sure what that means when the police say that they can't do anything. You know, if somebody breaks the law, they break the law and that um, the police can certainly issue a ticket for that. Um, I think in terms of finding somebody or um, the likelihood of proving something may, may pose an additional challenge. So one of the uh, major pieces that we put in the budget this year and passed legislation around is through automated traffic enforcement. And the hope there is to have more cameras throughout the city. So when a car or bike or any road user is um, you know, speeding, running a stop sign, uh, running a red light, doing anything that is dangerous for others on the road, um, that enforcement tool can be handled through the Department of Transportation because we'll have access to people's license plates um, or bike or whatever it may be. And so my hope is that for all of these types of violations, this new system will make enforcement more feasible um, moving forward. The other thing I'll say is we worked on legislation that we passed last year for scooter regulation because there were a few years where it really was um, free for all in a lot of ways. And so one of the requirements of the legislation was that all scooters have to be locked to something. It's called a lock to requirement. Um, and so I hope uh, that starting last October 1st, you all have noticed a little bit of a difference because that's when the law was implemented, um, that scooters are not allowed to be left on the sidewalk anymore. They have to be locked to something and we significantly reduced the speed limit. One of the problems we still have is some people aren't locking to, some people are still speeding past, as you mentioned, some people are um, scooting on the sidewalk when they should be on the road or vice versa. And it can be very dangerous for pedestrians. And so one of the questions I asked last week or two weeks ago in my performance oversight hearing with the Department of Transportation is how they're holding scooter companies accountable when their users are violating the terms of agreement. And the answer was pretty unsatisfactory, frankly, which was that it's up to the scooter company to um, report to us when there are violations. 
And I don't think that that's uh, necessarily the best path forward because scooter company is not incentivized to tell the city something that may harm their contract with the city. And so that's something that I'm working with my colleagues now to figure out how we can really monitor these violations and make sure that um, there's more action taken. But thank you for, for sharing that. Yeah, and I hear you that. trying to attack it at a bunch of different angles. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Carol, I think you had a question. Yes, and thank you again, Brooke, for joining us. This has been wonderful to hear you, and you clearly have a broad uh, depth and and uh, breadth of knowledge about what's going on in our ward in the city. And in that spirit, a very general question for you. So uh, we talked about the fact that you've basically been on the city council during um, COVID, and um, hopefully now we're coming out of that period and past it. What do you see happening in the city as we move past the pandemic into more of an endemic phase and with uh, your leadership and that of uh, the mayor kind of moving us beyond this period of our history and into a more positive future ahead? Um, I see great things. Um, I have a lot of hope for our recovery in the city. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the, um, the level of palpable joy I feel from people who are now able to be in person with one another um, and the recognition of how important it is to interact in person with our neighbors and our friends and our family and our loved ones, I think is really gonna drive a lot of our recovery, that kind of innate human need. Um, and I think we all need to remember that need as it is natural, um, how scary the last two years was to kind of go insular and, and retreat inwards to remember that, you know, we're all I hope vaccinated and boosted um, and, and can be safe in person with one another. But I think there are a lot of really exciting things that we'll see in our city. I think that um, people are using different modes of transportation. My hope is that our service lines for our buses and our Metro will become much more reliable as we get more and more people moving around the city. One of the things I continue to share with WMATA is that we cannot make service lines based on current demand. We have to make accessibility 5X, 20X what it is now, because then people will, will use those lines. Um, I see a lot of great entrepreneurs and new business ideas coming. I hope that they lease space downtown and in Georgetown um, and, and fill up some of our weak vacant retail spaces. Um, and I see a lot of mobilization. We talked a little bit about um, the care pilot program and getting folks into housing. Um, there are unprecedented investments and there are so many folks who are living unsheltered outside right now that my hope is in the next couple of years, um, that will be significantly decreased with the mobilization of the thousands of housing vouchers that we have available. So I'm hopeful about our recovery. Um, I think that we have built excellent partnerships, not only within our city, but with our regional partners in Maryland and Virginia, um, and even Delaware. And so I'm excited uh, for where we're, where we're headed. Great, thank you so much. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. Um, were there other questions for Brooke before? Uh, yes, Liz, you'll need to unmute, please. There Thank you, you go. Thank you, for, thank you so much for coming to us. Um, I have a question on the bike issue about bike lanes. I live on Dumbarton Street between 31st and 30th, and some time ago, there was something that came around saying we were due for bike lanes. And, uh, you know, and my block is a downhill bike uh, block and bikes every few days, one of them speeds down it and across 30th street without stopping. Uh, they don't need bike lanes. I think the street is so narrow as it is and parking is hard. I don't see why bikes can't stick to the big streets like M and P and you know where there's room to accommodate them. Well, thank you so much. I think that they're um, part of what you know. I was just speaking with Carol about is some of the changes in, in 
ways that people get around that we've seen. Um, and biking is one of them. Throughout the pandemic, so many more residents are using bikes to get around than ever were before. And it'll be interesting to see if some of those trends stick. Um, but there have been a, an expansion of bike lanes throughout the city. And I think as we do those bike lanes, it's important to make sure that they're um, protected and safe and that they're connected to other bike lanes. So right now when bikers uh, bike to Georgetown, they're kind of dropped off on M Street and it's hard to, to get around. Many of them have to kind of get off their bike and, and move forward. Now, with that being said, um, Dumbarton was proposed. I agree that that was not a sensible route path. Um, for bikers to get through the neighborhood. Um, I heard you, uh, the Department of Transportation, heard many neighbors who were concerned. And so that bike lane um, proposal is canceled for now through Dumbart. That's not happening anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, let's see, are there other questions? I'm trying to scan, scan the room. So please, um, if you have a question, either unmute or put it in the chat. Um, and if not, um, it looks like you will be able to get to your next meeting on time, Brooke. Thank <laughs> you so very much for joining us today and for all you're doing for us. Definitely, we appreciate it and we appreciate your support of the villages and of our community. Well, thank you all so much. Thanks for your partnership, Lynn, and all your, your and Carol's leadership of the Georgetown Village. Um, and notwithstanding, um, our friend Betty, who, who wasn't able to reach our office, and I'm so sorry about that, but please all reach out anytime. Uh, we are here to support you and, and work with you. So thank you very much, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Great. Thanks, Brooke. Have a nice evening, everyone. And remember, our next CCC program is March 24th with Kitty Greenwald. We hope to see you there. Bye now. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>